we start with our first webinar entitled Teaching English in Face-to-Face -face and Distance Education Environments, Best Practices and Challenges by the National English Advisor from the Ministry of Public Education and College Professor at UNA, Dr. Ana Campos Centeno. With the purpose of maximizing the time for every session, we invite you to ask your questions in the chat of this Zoom session. These questions will be written down by our organizing committee, and we will share them with the specialists following their posting order in the chat. We advise you to verify that when posting your questions, you are sharing them with the whole group of the session. If because of time constraints, any question cannot be answered in this session, the organizing committee will send it to the specialist and he or she will send the answer via email to the participants of this seminar. Ana Isabel Campos Centeno is a national English advisor for the Department of First and Second Cycles of the Ministry of Public Education. She coordinated the reform of the new English curriculum. Ana Isabel Campos received her doctoral degree in Latin American Studies from the National University of Costa Rica. She also holds a master's degree in teaching of English as a second language from the University of Kansas and a BA in the teaching of English as a foreign language from the University of Costa Rica. She is a former fellow of the Fulbright program and the last years has collaborated as a professor in the master's program in applied linguistics at the National University, Heredia Campus. During the last 30 years, she has taught English in public and private institutions at preschool, elementary, high school, and university level. Without further ado, let us welcome Dr. Ana Campos. Hello uh, to everyone uh, that uh, is attending this uh, very important seminar organized by UNET. I am very honored to have the opportunity to talk to you about um, what this all this pandemic has left us so far as learnings. Um, and I'm going to talk using the voices of you teachers. In order to, to make this presentation, I interviewed several teachers in order to know how they have been coping with it and um, and what are what are the learnings and what are some be best practices that they that they consider worthy to to share with you today so first of all i want to to welcome you to the seminar and i want to say thank you to the organizing committee for the invitation uh, so that i could participate um, well i am going to begin sharing my screen uh, in order to, to start, um, I also would like, if any of you uh, want to, to say something to participate, I will be asking some questions. So I would like to see if you can type or react to the questions on the, on the, on the chat so that uh, I, can, I can get also your, your voices, um, if possible, right, if possible. Um, okay, let me see. All right, so uh, the topic today is um, how, uh, how this um, new reality that we as English teachers are facing in this distance education model, what, what are the learnings so far? How has the global crisis and the pandemic challenged all the pillars? that uh, we have uh, taught or we were taught or we understood, you know, as, as truths, you know, as, as this, this is the way it should be, this is the way it must be. So I would like to challenge, you know, to challenge in this, in this conversation, in this lecture, those pillars, those understandings as we move on in the presentation. And here is where I sometimes will like your thoughts, your reactions. Um, so in order to start uh, in this um, short uh, survey that I carried out, th those were um, really very on-depth interviews to teachers, 
the first question was, what feelings have teachers experienced in this new reality? How they have felt since the pandemic started and schools were closed. We have been, you know, going through different types of teaching and learning scenarios, going from distance learning, you know, when the pandemic started, and now we are switching again into, into what is called combined, right? Where teachers have face-to-face -face and also distance learning scenarios. And not only teachers, you know, because now the center, the real center, the target, which are our students have also been challenged, right? Because they were not, they, they, they were not used to, to, to this type of, 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 of teachings and this type of learnings. So I don't know if you feel familiar with what teachers responded, but most of them, they were around 20 teachers, and most of them said, I felt frustrated. I felt overwhelmed. I felt perplexed. I was uncertain about what was coming next. Do you feel familiar with that, the ones who are teachers? Now, my question is for you, how do you feel even now? How do you feel? Because we are still, you know, in this, we are still transiting this, this path of change. How do you feel? What are some of your feelings? Are you still, or do you, um, you know, kind of identify with the feelings of those teachers? Are you still kind of experiencing some sort of frustration, uncertainty, uh, overwhelmingness? Um, so that will be interesting to know if it's possible to get uh, some, I'm oh, sorry, some answers on the chat, right? Yes, uh, uh, somebody here, I read strange. I felt strange, right, about this new, new reality. And that is normal. We need to understand that when we go through change, when we face things we are not used to, uh, the frustration, the uncertainty, uh, the overwhelmingness, those things are just normal. And always think that those feelings are not only yours. The rest of the teaching community are experiencing them as well, and also the students, the students too. Um, okay. Uh, how has the pandemic challenged traditional education? I think that is, that is a very important question to reflect. And also besides that, the other question is, what are the myths? You know, the myths, what is a myth? A myth is something that we consider that is true, but is not a fact anymore. Perhaps in the past, it was a truth, but now, as you know, new things come up, it becomes a myth. So what are some you know, myths that now you know, are becoming myths because they are not real anymore about teaching, about learning that we need to overcome due to this um, change that we are facing and is here to stay. It's not going to, it's not going to go back to, to the way it used to be. We also need to be clear about that. Okay, let's think about the place, the space where learning happens. So we were used to a traditional classroom. We are used to still to a traditional classroom as the only space where learning can happen. So, um, so if, we, if we were asked, where does learning happen? Where does formal education um, occur, probably all of you will agree that, is it, that it is at the school, that it is in the classroom, right? But let's see, teachers, that this is becoming a myth. This is becoming a myth that now we have to overcome. What is the reality? What is the reality? Well, if we take a look to these pictures, Learning happens 
anywhere, at any time. If we take a look to the pictures of the children there, they are learning outside the classroom. You know, in this environment, they are using, they are engaged. If you take a look to them, you will see them, you know, focused, you know, using their, their whole body. This is a type of experiential learning, right? They are in contact with real, with a real environment, using their hands, using their minds, using their emotions, their feelings, uh, learning from each other. So here, this is not like the, the, the classroom we used to think as a classroom with, um, you know, a, a room with uh, desks, with chairs, with a board. So now we need to, you know, overcome that myth that is just that place where learning can happen. Learning can happen anywhere at any time. Even if kids are walking in the streets, if kids go to the supermarket, if kids are interacting online, they are learning. So now learning has no walls. The walls have disappeared. So this is a myth now that learning can only happen in those four walls. What is another, another question? What about the one who teaches? What about us? What is the myth that we have to overcome with this new reality? Well, that myth is the following. Only a teacher teaches. That is another myth, right? In the past, we used to think it's, it is true. It is true. We are trained. We are trained. We go to the university. We get a degree. We are formed. You know, we develop several skills, competences to, to organize, you know, learning to become experts about what decisions we have to make, what things we have to take into account so that learning can happen. But we will see that though it is true that we get that formation, we are not the only ones who can do it. So um, here, if you take a look to that picture, what is happening there? All right, you see a lot of students and all of them are focused, are active. It is even hard to recognize where the teacher is. You really have to make a, an effort to pay attention and say, yes, that's the teacher. But you can see that in that environment, right? In that environment, there are a lot of people that are also learning from each other that become teachers as well and that can not only happen in that space but that can happen in any other space right so not only the teacher is the one who learn we can learn collaboratively right talking with others listening to others we can also learn now at home I, I, I think I, I will not have the time to play the videos, but I have received a lot of videos from teachers all over Costa Rica showing me what their kids can do or are doing at home. So there's, in some cases, because we will see that that is not like a general reality, but in some cases, parents are becoming teachers too. They are helping their children pronouncing words they are guiding the children to do these gtas right that now are given to kids as the material to organize their learning so i in these pictures there are kids in in uh, in rural costa rica you know that are expressing you know what they can do using english from their houses so that means that it's not only in the classroom environment where we used to place teaching where kids can learn, right? Uh, so um, that means that we learn collaboratively and that is part of this, uh, this uh, socio-constructivism uh, approach, right? We learned 
in social interaction with others, with peers, family, community, all of them play an active role in what we are, in, in who we are, in the skills we have, right? So let's just think, for example, that now kids, if they have access to the internet, they can be, you know, interacting with their computer, watching a video, watching a program, uh, playing a game, and they are learning English. I have been amazed about, you know, finding people, young people who speak English pretty well. And when I ask them, where did you learn your English? I see that it's pretty good. And you know the answer. Most of them are telling me, playing video games, interacting with tourists, uh, watching uh, movies online, uh, listening to music. So it seems that there are a lot of inputs, a lot of, you know, uh, teachers, let's say, right, that we need when we are learning a language that are available for learners outside the classroom. I remember that when I was formed, when I was learning English, I didn't have that because technology was not available, but now it is. So that's why now we are overcoming a myth that is that we can only learn in the classroom with a teacher modeling the language. Um, so that's what we wanted to show the, the student as the center and all the ways in which they, students can learn. And of course, that doesn't mean that the role of the teacher is less important, right? That, we are not saying that because the teacher is the one who still knows how to articulate as an um, orchestra director, you know, how can the parents help? How can the peers also help? We can, we can also, you know, try to integrate those actors and and, and, you know, make those uh, actors, you know, contribute to our target, to our uh, goal that is to facilitate, in this case, the learning of a language in a child, in a learner. And uh, without considering, of course, that there are other things uh, beyond the classroom where uh, that help them, that facilitate also that learning. Now, what about the what? We were talking about the place, we were talking about the who, and now let's talk about the what. That is the curriculum. That is what we consider that is worth learning. Um, is it, you know, is it only that what, what is in, now in, in, in a subject matter? What, what we have to teach, let's say, okay, I was formed as an English teacher. So the only thing I have to teach when I enter the classroom, immediately that I enter the classroom, my only, you know, goal in mind is I have to teach language. I have to teach English. Is it like that, right? That, you know, that's my formation. That's my uh, specialty. So that's what I have to teach. So this is another myth, you know, in this new scenario, that the only learning that should be taught is the subject matter. Why is that becoming a myth? Because again, if we take a look to this picture, to this picture, what are they learning? If we can begin analyzing everything that is happening there, can you say, Yes, what they are learning there is math. That's it. That is a math teacher. Can we really, you know, like for sure say or, or confirm, affirm, make that affirmation here and we make it? Is it science, what they are learning? Is it chemistry? Right? Well, we are not we are not so sure. Is it it could be social studies, you know, or is it an integration of the curriculum? Perhaps they are learning math, science, Spanish or English, uh, chemistry. So we can see that we have to be skillful 
not only in a in one single like uh, area of of discipline, area of knowledge, but we need to expand our abilities and the knowledge that we have because in this new reality and and also something that is promoted because that's the way the brain works is that we can also integrate integrate and this integration in our case as english teachers also means um you know in these new models of immersion where teacher where, where a teacher uses english only as a vehicle, you know, to communicate, but he can be teaching math, he can be teaching science, he can be teaching social studies, right? And this is more, can become more meaningful and can add up more to the learning of the students. So we, we need to be prepared for that, right? To think that we need to expand because learning doesn't happen like in small, capsules where there is here English, there is here math, there is here social studies, but we need to go beyond that. And, and for example, in our English curriculum, if we take a look uh, to the underpinnings of this curriculum and also in these scenarios that we have here, if we take a look this, I took this from um, fourth grade, fourth grade. So if we take a look to the scenarios, what learnings, what competences? Well, we know that we are working mostly with, with uh, four or five competences, but do we see there other disciplines of learning? For example, natural treasures, right? This could belong perfectly to social studies. It could belong to science. It could be integrating English social studies science. If we take a look to the scenario, staying safe in a digital world, we are also integrating English with technology, with values, because it's not only the cognitive aspects, right? We also have to pay attention to, well, I mean, the cognitive aspects is not only English, it's critical thinking, it's creativity, it's collaboration, you know, and besides that, we are also integrating values. And, and, and sociocultural aspects. Remember that in our curriculum, we have three pillars. We have the learn to know, the learn to do, and the learn to be and live in a society. The same is true with environmentally speaking. There, we are going beyond teaching English per se, but we are also teaching people to be aware of the responsibility they have to keep you know, our planet clean, to uh, respect nature, to be aware of the importance of um, sustainability and, and having a sustainable world, sustainable community, sustainable home, and sustainable self. Uh, we have this scenario focus on the future, right? As that is more, you know, in terms of the interests and, and the future, you know, and the talents of, of the students, their future uh, dreams, uh, um, and also their voca vocations as well. So you can see that even in our curriculum, we are not only teaching English, right? But we are trying to integrate aspects, several aspects of the curriculum, because that's how we work in the real world. That's why students have to become social agents. They have to be able to use English to communicate in real life scenarios. And that's why the curriculum is framed from scenarios and the scenarios are related with those uh, knowledge, skills, and competences that they need. So um, learning and this idea of integration is that learning happens by making connections. It's not by separating things into 
you know, small compartments, but learning happens when we are able to make these connections. So we as teachers in our formation also need to expand ourselves, you know, and I think technology in terms of, of that can be of great, great help because a lot of information is there where we can also expand because we are teaching a language and we can get a lot of resources and input, you know, that is available for us to make it available to our students. Uh, the, the other, the other uh, myth that we have to overcome is how to teach best. So we are now seeing that in order to learn, we need to connect in, instead of in, instead of divide, dividing things, you know, saying English is the only thing, it's the only thing. No, no, no. We are not only English teachers, we are educators, we are forming students to face the challenges that they have to face in this world that is very uncertain, by the way. So, how to teach best, how to connect those dots um, and make learning easy and make learning enjoyable. Um, so uh, here now we have this scenario, right? We have to teach, some of us have to learn to teach online because, um, well, the research that we have and the trends that are, that, that are seen, you know, in, in now in the present and coming up in the real future is that online is here and it's going to stay, um, we don't know for how long, you know, uh, and other things are going to come up with technology, but we need to get used to this form of teaching. Also, that doesn't mean that face-to-face -face teaching is going to disappear. No, not at all. But we also need to understand the new forms, new ways of delivering the teaching, you know, um, these new ways are emerging and we need to be ready for that. Uh, so, what are some, now after we were able to analyze the myths that we need to overcome, one related with the where, the other related with the who, the other related with the what, and the last one related with the how, now let's a little bit focused on how this how, this how has been for the teachers and for the students, the ones that I was able to interview. So in this combined model, what are the main challenges that teachers have identified so far? And let me tell you, this is very important for us, decision makers, for universities, for you, because you are the ones in the classrooms. And I think as I read this, you will say, yes, it's true. That's what I feel. And this is what I see. Perhaps, or perhaps you have more to say and more to add. And let me tell you that I am willing to collect that information because I think that now we are, um, living the history, the history of change. You know, we are, we are becoming subjects and objects, right? Because we are, we are learning in the way about this, this, these things that we knew. You know, we knew because we knew that technology was there, and and we have been talking about the importance of technology as um, as a way, you know, to access knowledge and as a way to learn as a tool, but the thing is that until we were able to be immersed in a situation where we had no way out, learned or learned because a lot of people were resistant to this change. Now let's see the challenges that teachers have been facing. Okay, the first one that all the teachers mentioned was equity. So they said the most important challenge that I faced when teaching in a combined model, face to face and distance, some online because this changes according to the, the, the school and changes according to the setting and the resources available, they say equity. And what about equity? They say, well, some students do not have equipment. Some students do not have connectivity. So uh, to be in contact with the teacher through distance learning, that's a big, challenge because some teachers you know for the first time and I think that has you know advantages and also has advantages that some teachers have told me Anna now I know better my students some of them because now I know what is to go to their house I know what is go and meet 
uh, the mother or the, or the father, I know how they live. I have known what is to go and knock that door and ask the mother or the father, what about your son or your daughter? Uh, why is she not, uh, you know, has been disconnected completely? So they are knowing better the reality, becoming more sensitive to their students' needs. Uh, they say sometimes the uh, direct contact with the students is weakened. Um, uh, the progress of the students is not the same. So that means that this, um, you know, this uh, changing situations among students, because not all of them have the same conditions, even in one classroom, makes that they say some progress more, some do not progress at the, at the rate they are expected to. And they say a gap begins to be created among students. And that is one of the reasons what some of them said, I am frustrated because I see that some of them are advancing, some of them are left behind. And I think this is a reality that we need to face. And we need, again, to get those, uh, that uh, compromise that we acquired as teachers, right? In order to see how can we, um, not say that we are going to solve the whole problem, the whole situation, but how can we as teachers contribute, you know, to bring those students back or to support those students or those parents or, or, the, or, or to motivate them so that they can, you know, get connected as well, at least, at least, you know, in a, in a, in, uh, even if it is in a small, um, uh, in a small quantity or amount, you know, that, that of motivation that we can, you know, inspire on them that counts. The other thing that teachers uh, manifested is equipment. So they say some teachers do not have access to internet in their schools. Uh, so sometimes we have to struggle at school because we would like to, you know, to, 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 to get uh, connected with them, but we don't we don't have connectivity. They also told me the the best way to connect with students is WhatsApp. I think WhatsApp is like the tool selected by all teachers is tool number one. You know, to be in contact with the students uh, is not a hundred percent reliable according to their. Uh, experiences, they say it depends on, on parents as again, if, if they have access to the internet, if they can pay for the internet, the, 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 the type of contracts of internet that they have. Also, they say some students do not have a cell phone, some of them do not have a laptop, and some have access, others have limited access. So equipment continues to be a challenge for the school system, for, for the country um, as a challenge to overcome. In terms of the evidences of learning, they uh, said they claimed that some students uh, do not turn on uh, on time the GTAs or or the assessment strategies that are given to them, uh, and some of them do not complete all the activities. And and here again we have to reflect: is it because I think it's not just like information that we are getting, but we need to see. Uh, what ways we can create in the school or as teachers so that kids you know can you know send this in a in a very when they go and and and, and pick up the food or something like that they can collect they can bring those evidences or why they do not complete them uh truly right so we need to find out if you see that they are too long if we can make them shorter if they can if we can make them more achievable so that students can be successful and that can motivate them to complete that and to make it attractive, right? I will refer to that later. Uh, the role of parents. Also, some of the teachers said um, some parents do not support the children's learning process. We have parents that do not support and that makes a difference. We have a difference between the children whose parents are very supportive and children whose parents are not. So that also makes a difference in the progress of the kids. In terms of the curriculum, they say we go slower in the development of the curriculum now. We have several groups, smaller groups. And so sometimes that, that makes our pacing slower. All right, we, we need to accept that, okay? We go slower, but we are going, you know, doing things well, 
then we can we are we are i think we are not losing right the problem is if we are not developing the curriculum as it should but what we are you know building is not strong enough so we as teachers know we are the experts in terms of that if if really you know what we are uh, constructing in in terms of the development of of those competences is really what what is needed uh, some teachers also said we make decisions and sometimes we have to make adjustments to the teaching, to the teaching, to the organization of the lessons. Sometimes they, uh, they also told me we made adjustments to the uh, format of the GTA. So some of them said it's not that I am taking elements out, but I am making a layout that is more attractive, that is easier for the students. Things like those, you know, were uh, told by the teacher. Another another thing is related with the implementation of the curriculum. They say that the possibility of clarifying doubts, they consider that is compromised. They say when we are in the classroom, uh, it's easier for us to clarify doubts when they are uh, distance learning. Uh, this is cannot be done. Some of them told me we do our best when we have them face to face, you know, to work in this clarification to make sure that they understand what they have to do. So they told me the center of the pedagogic media, pedagogical mediation is the GTA. We work uh, with that in the classroom and out of the classroom. Uh, about the development of the, of, the, of the four linguistic competences, they said, um, I say that it's possible to work all of them. Most of them agreed, but they said sometimes the, the ones that are more difficult to work, depending on the scenarios that we have available, are speaking and sometimes writing. They said listening, uh, if we send a CD, if, if they have access to a video, uh, we, uh, or if we do the listening in the classroom, it's possible to develop listening pretty well. And also we work with reading, but sometimes speaking is, is not so easy to develop. However, as I told you, I have received a lot of evidences from teachers where students, you know, are recording their videos and expressing, describing, interacting. Um, then um, they said that a big challenge that they have is how to make distance learning as effective as face-to-face. -face. So I think that's a challenge that we all have at all levels, at the national advisory level, at the university level, and you that are in the classrooms, you know, facing the situation. How can we make distance learning as effective? I have, you know, a hypothesis. I think the learning process, the learning of a language, and, and we will analyze some of those principles, you know, like uh, engaging students, a lot of comprehensible input, a lot of practice, 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 so that they can then, you know, internalize that language and those forms and, and, and real life in real life tasks they can perform. Uh, I think that uh, we need to make sure that those things can happen as well in a distance learning environment. But of course, again, we need to have also the conditions. We need to have, students need to have tools and, and students need to have connectivity so that we can model for them so that they can listen to the teacher. But still, you know, we need to, to do more, more work on that. And I think that's a, a an area that requires demands research. How can we make both scenarios effective and, and, and with evidence? Uh, advantages, advantages that teachers have found. They said now we work with smaller groups. So they say that's an advantage because we can personalize the attention to the learners. So let's take that as an advantage and let's make the most of that teaching, real teaching time that we have when we have our students in a face-to-face -face environment, especially those that we cannot reach otherwise. Uh, also, they said that what another advantage is that there is more flexibility, flexibility for the students and flexibility for the teachers in terms of how to teach. 
and if it is a, a synchronous or a, a, a synchronous a way of teaching. And uh, also they say that another, another thing that comes here that is coming into place that is very positive is that now there is more involvement from the parents. So they say now we see more parents that are involved that in the past, you know, it was very, very, very uh, small or very, the amount of parents was almost non-existent. But they say now there are more parents that are participating actively in the learning process of their uh, children. Uh, the challenges for the students, they say that it's a big challenge for them to learn to work on their own, to develop, to self-regulate, you know, to know what is a time for, for, for studying. Sometimes the, the, the house environment is very messy, disruptive. So that's a challenge, you know, to, to focus, to learn to, to focus and to work um, in an autonomous way. Also, they say that some students do not know how to use technology very well. So that's something also that becomes that can become a challenge for some learners, and they have to make a big effort to learn to work uh, to learn to understand a platforms. In some contexts, it happens. In others, you know, students are very smart and and very quick with that. Uh, and 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 they say that it's positive that some students have more time to work at their own pace. In assessment, there are also challenges. They mentioned that um, uh, some students pay to people to solve the assessment strategy. So they see that as a big challenge and something that, that families and students need to work more in on the ethical part. You know, that is your own learning here. It's not just, you know, paying somebody and then what about you, about what you know? And if you have to demonstrate that you can use, for example, English, but somebody is doing your work, so you are not benefiting, you are not getting anything from that. So I think we need to work on, on, on the ethical part a lot. And then teachers, of course, say when, when this happens, the reliability of that assessment is compromised, right? We really cannot say that learners are gaining competences because we don't know who's doing the work for them. And they say that when the student and the family collaborate, um, then uh, the learning process goes very, very well and, and the assessment as well. Um, they also were criticizing a little bit, you know, so far uh, formative assessment because they say that sometimes it's not challenging, but again, it depends on how we do it as teachers. I say that that is something that we have to ask ourselves, how can I make formative assessment a process that, that, that is, um, you know, that gives something to the learner that the learner says yes this is good for me you know i am growing i see the benefit of formative assessment how can i make it appropriate to the level because if it is not challenging that means that they are not feeling that they are getting something out of this process uh sometimes they say it's too flexible no supervision no rules um uh so students are not challenged to do their best especially with you know the assessment strategy perhaps here they are referring more to that um and again as i said before we need to work more on the ethical part of of doing things on my own right on uh, taking care of my formation of the skills i'm gaining because in the real world if if i cannot demonstrate what i can do so I am cheating myself, right? It's not, you know, the, 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 the effect is not for the others or the impact is, is, for, my, is for me. Uh, then they say, another thing that teachers were saying is how to assess a student that I do not know well, because they said sometimes we uh, uh, lose contact, we lose this connection. And so how can I really no, if, if, if this grade I am giving is, 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 is you know, is, is um, connected to the performance of the learner because we don't really know if that is the real performance. Uh, okay, so those are some of the, of the things that I have been able to collect so far and I am very thankful to the teachers that have participated and have, you know, provided uh, insights for us as feedback of how this, um, 
what are the most important challenges that they face and, uh, and, and they are also the benefits you know, of this experience. Uh, so that means that we have to work more a lot on assessments. That's another, another element that, that we need to, you know, to, as I said before, to reflect in how we are doing it. Why is it not, why do they say it's not challenging for the learner? Okay, the seven principles of learning, I wanted to talk about this because uh, we need to, in this new reality that we are facing, what things we need to keep in mind as teachers, you know, in order to be more effective. Okay, number one, okay, this, I took this from, um, from a book that is called The Nature of Learning. It was written by o, o, um, OCD. And, and number one, the number one principle says engaging the learner is key. So the, the most important principle is to capture the mind, the heart, feelings of the learner. If you are able to engage your learner, then you have won 50% of the, of, of, the, of the learning process. So engaging, and then what you need is to keep, you know, this engagement, but you need to capture that since the very beginning. So how can we do it? The, in, the, in the GTA, we need to include always a warm up that is part of the pre-teaching and an activation of their prior knowledge so that we can connect the learner with the learning. And this has to be fun. You know, something that is enjoyable, that brings a smile, that makes eyes sparkle has to be active, you know, so that they can move their bodies. Ludic, games, uh, it has to be interactive or, and varied. One of the teachers used a very interesting metaphor because, you know, he was also pointing to this aspect when I asked him, what do you think works? And he said, I'm gonna give you, I'm going to give you a metaphor for this. Let's say that we are using the GTA, and let's say that the GTA is food. What happens if you are giving every day rice, beans, and cheese? And after a week, perhaps you are just tired, bored of eating rice, beans, and cheese. Perhaps if you change the cheese for meat, for salad, for something else. So that will be more appealing. So it's the same. You know, if we try to incorporate a new, a new type of warm up, some one day music, another way, something that they can color, cut, you know, make a puppet uh, where they can use their, their creativity, where they can, uh, you know, uh, make a crossword, where they can sing. So we need to make sure that this first, if it is distance or if it is in the classroom face to face, that this first moment is engaging. Even if you create a video for them and they can see the video, make sure that what you are doing engages your students. A joke, make them laugh. That could be like, a, you know, this thing, this special thing that will create that connection. The second principle that you have to keep in mind after engaging is the learning environment. And if it is in your classroom, you have control. Make sure that it is safe. If we are in this pandemic, you know that kids have alcohol or they can wash their hands, that you know they are wearing their masks, that they are keeping the distancing, the social distancing that is relaxed that is appealing, even if you don't have a lot of resources of it's not your classroom, why don't you try a puppet? You can buy seven puppets, small ones. You can even buy a secondhand toy and you can have one puppet every day. And so they will see, or every lesson, so they can see a new thing in your classroom that, you know, 
captures their attention. They say, mm, wow, that's interesting, teacher. What is that? And they can play, and you can talk, and all that. So make sure that the classroom environment is changing as well. You know, it's not the same all the time, the same routine, the same thing, because in real life, if everything is always the same, we get bored. And the same happens with our students. Promote as well different ways of learning individually when it is needed in collaboration also so that they have different types of interactions in this environment that also changes the pacing of the lesson and also changes even the energy of the class so make sure to pay attention to your learning environment even if if, if and if it is at home do the same talk to the parents right um now the principle number three and please let me know about my time. Principle number three uh, is that the pedagogical mediation must connect three things. Make sure to connect the emotions of the children, their motivation and cognition, of course, the mind. One of the teachers that I had the chance to talk uh, with, she said, one of my concerns is that at if I don't see my first graders, you know, I need to connect with them because it's the first year and I need and I need them to love English. So if I am able to see them and to, you know, get this emotional connection, they are going to, to be engaged and they are going to like English and like the class. So the emotions and the motivation, especially with children, is very important. Try to create authentic experiences. If you are, let's say, the, uh, working with the scenario of pets. So if you bring, oh, can I not see your screen? Um, okay. I don't know how many people cannot see. A lot of people cannot see my screen. Yes, we can see it, Anna. Oh, thank you. I just saw a message. Thank you so much. So make sure, make sure to use authentic experiences. If you are working with, with pets, so uh, make a picture or take a picture of your pet, bring pictures, create drawings or create, if you do not have a camera or a cell phone, uh, bring, it could be, you know, bring a, a drawing of your pet. And so that is personal. It's my emotion. It's, 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 it's a friend that I, as a child, have. It's a family member. Use things that connect with their context, with their families, what they do. Use concrete things, what we call uh, realia. Use personalization. Bring things that belong to you. If you bring something that is yours, you say, this is my pet, or this is my family, or this is uh, my favorite food, and you bring it and you show it, they will be interested because it's what the teacher likes. It's something that belongs to the teacher. A lot of comprehensible input gestures make sure that you make gestures to make the meanings clear repetition and a lot of things that uh, create that real life atmosphere also another recommendation if you have a gta break it into smaller ones break it into smaller ones and tell the parents he's only going to do this piece and then he will do the next piece because if you give a long long assignment or task it will become unachievable it's like another example if you are invited for dinner or lunch and somebody serves you a lot of food on your plate what is going to happen? Perhaps you might be very hungry, but then you will say, no, I am not hungry anymore because that's too much, right? So it's the same with the kids. If you give them long, long tasks, they see them and they will get discouraged, right? When they see that. So make sure to break them down into small ones so that they are achievable for the student, for the learner. The fourth, principle number four, um, sorry. Uh, also, modeling is important. Give examples, right? Make sure that they understand what they have to do. Provide an example. Clarify doubts. 
even if you have to write English, Spanish, make sure that they understand and also give them the goals, the, the assessment strategies in this case. I have noticed GT, GTAs that do not have the assessment strategy at the beginning. So we don't know what is what they are learning. So make sure to know exactly what you want them to, uh, to achieve at the end of the process, right? Not only in the rubric at the end, since the very beginning, they should know what is expected from them. May, take into account and have in your mind that all learners are unique. So trying to use, you know, a very, an array of strategies, even in the GTA, music, um, uh, games, uh, where they have to, to draw or accommodate or, or classify or sequence sequencing pictures, you know, uh, collaborating, uh, where they have to move in order to express, it could be a command or to give a command. So try to include the multiple intelligences approach or method in, in, in your GTA so that they have variety and also are addressing the learning styles of students. Uh, that is also very important. Also, make sure that all the learning experiences are inclusive. You know, this is related with this universal um, design uh, model uh, uh, for teaching and learning where we have to use different types of uh, stimuli. It could be visual, it could be uh, oral, it could be uh, tactile, uh, it could be kinesthetic, but we need to use multiple means of representation of action and expression so that kids have different ways to express what they know, what they, in which, you know, they are stronger. If a child has more ability to express something in written way, let's try to give them more opportunities to do it like that. That doesn't mean that that is the only way, but give him the time, the chance to get to gain confidence. Also, multiple means of action and engagement that I think I already referred to that. Uh, then in terms of formative assessment and feedback is very important if we do it the right way, it fosters learning. So uh, make sure that learners participate actively in setting goals, in assessing their, themselves, you know, when they see the, the goal, how I did it. Uh, create rubrics, checklists that you discuss with them, that you explain to them, that they understand so that they can use effectively. Uh, let, let them uh, take time for reflection. Also create opportunities for self-assessment and peer assessment and find ways, different ways, experience, experiment with different ways of giving feedback. Sometimes the feedback doesn't have to be, you know, like straightforward, like saying, repeat this word, but how to, to find different ways to give feedback that makes the learner feel confident. And as this, at the same time makes him, you know, like willing to improve, motivated to change and to continue working. And finally, the seventh principle is to build horizontal connections, right? with other areas. That means not only focus in English, in the subject matter, try to connect what learners are doing with the real world, try to connect what the learners are learning with other areas, even talk to the other teachers and try to find ways in which we can connect those dots so that the learning becomes meaningful because they say, ah, yes, I am learning that in science. Yes, I am learning that in math and it's connected with English. So I can now say that in English and I can say it in Spanish. And that creates, or I can use it, you know, in my house or I can, I can apply it in the community. So that creates deeper levels of understanding. And um, one way that we, you know, inserted in the curriculum are uh, one way are the mini projects and tasks uh, that the purpose is to promote collaborative work to develop autonomy to reinforce soft skills you know when we work collaboratively we are developing social skills as well uh, so socio-affective skills as well also um, 
uh, promote learning to manage time, promote personal and group responsibilities. So we need to work in the meta cognitive, the meta affective and the meta social. People or learners that become aware, right? Of how to communicate with other people about their own feelings and to be aware of the feelings of their partners, right? And to be aware of their strengths when they are learning and also the areas where they have limitations. Um, and also let them get closer to the reality of the community, of the country and the world through the mini projects and the tasks that you design. Um, and, and here we have it in the action-oriented approach, in the pre-teaching, we are in, we, the intention is to engage the learner there by the warm-up, with the warm-up and using also the activation of prior knowledge and the modeling. And also in the pre-task, we again go back to that, but now connected with a goal, with a competence. In the task rehearsal, it, the, the student is doing it and we are watching, right? In the pre-task, we provide examples. What I said, the clarification, the modeling is given to them. And then in the task rehearsal, they do it. And in the task completion, they do it alone and they reflect on their performance. And finally, in collaboration, they can do self-assessment or peer assessment. And uh, the last uh, part that I want to share is that in my conversations with teachers talking about best practices using technology, this is what they said. They said that the things that have been most useful and effective for them has been PowerPoint presentations with audios that they sometimes videotape. Uh, Jamboard, live worksheets, Randall's lab, Word, World, Microsoft Teams, quizzes, Padlet, beautiful I, um, AI. Um, and I wrote here in Spanish recording of videos. They also record videos for their students, vocabulary, Padlets, Kahoot, uh, videos in YouTube, presentations online, a website that is called Educa Play, where they can create their own resources. It's very good. I was, you know, exploring all of them, and they are very good. They, some of them use personal blogs and websites, audios, like creating audios in VoiceMaker, Edmodo, uh, and of course, WhatsApp, they told me that was like the one that, you know, is useful almost for all these scenarios. Um, so uh, this is my presentation. I want to share this quote, you know, that I think summarizes somehow the voices of the teachers. I had the pleasure, the real pleasure to interview because they are, you know, they are highly committed in spite of the challenges and they were very honest. They opened their hearts and we have to teach with love so that learning happens no matter the quantity. What really matters is quality. So I want to close my presentation with that quote and, and motivate you to, you know, to keep open, you know, to the changes, open to uh, this moment that we are living, where we have to be very flexible, we, we, where we have to unlearn, because you see that there are many myths that need to be overcome. So we need to unlearn and we need to start relearning and, and be open to this constant relearning because I think the coming years are going to be like that. Learning, learning, relearning, relearning and adapting, right? To changes that are coming very, very fast. So um, thank you so much. And, and I will be now ready for any of your questions. We appreciate Dr. Campos' webinar, and we want to thank her deeply for participating in this community of practice. Thank you, Dr. Campos. Now, Master Rami Acuna, coordinator of the English teaching major for first and second cycles, will share the questions and comments posted in the chat. Rami? Uh, Ana, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, basically, we have some comments from the audience and a question. Uh, Wysan Hien, 
she says that integrated curriculum projects are greatly advised in this new pro approach to English language teaching. Uh, Professor Jorge Bogantes says, I think the main challenge is for MEP, finding the right connection for all the students. Uh, Carla Fallas says, it's sad to know that a lot of students don't have equipment or access to internet to join the virtual class. And Fernanda Cruz says, another challenge I suffered was to make virtual learning engagement, engaging for the students and even more now with hybrid learning. Milagro Sequeira says, can you mention, okay, that was related to the book. You mentioned a book. Can you mention again the name of the author of the book? Yes. Um, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, well, continue on. I think I will, I will take them all. All right. Maria Paula Molina says, sometimes I feel parents do not take virtual classes so seriously the way they should, they should be. That's in the private institution. And some of the participants agreed. Uh, and then Carolina Romero is asking a question. She says, what do you think about technology like robots? Will replace, will they replace teachers? Okay, so, uh, well, thank you so much for the comments. I think that, um, um, yes, I agree with you that uh, we are in a process of change and there are big challenges. At the school level, at the classroom level, and as MEPS level, and the country level, right? And I think one of the big challenges that uh, the country has is making sure that connectivity becomes connectivity and access to internet becomes a human right for students because in this new reality students need access to the internet so that they can connect through cell phones that most of the houses have a cell phone but sometimes the cell phone is not enough because they have no connectivity or limited connectivity and, um, and, and, and we know that with a cell phone, we can almost do anything. They can listen to the videos, they can chat with the teacher, they can connect online uh, through Microsoft Teams, for example. Uh, we also know that due to the geography of Costa Rica, you know, we have a lot of mountains and all that. It's not a flat country. There are places that do, that where access is very difficult, especially indigenous communities that are very isolated. And we still have also non-indigenous community, communities also that are, that are not indigenous, but are also isolated. And I completely agree with you that that is very sad. And we as a, as a nation, we have have to, you know, to push hard so that uh, this is something that can be done in the near, near future. And um, with regards to um, to uh, to assess uh, to the to the name of the book, the name of the book is the nature of learning. And I will put it on the chat. I will put the name on the chat so that uh, you can uh, you can have access to it. Then Rami, there was a question about assessment, if I am not mistaken. Can you repeat that question to me while I write on the chat the name of the book? All right, let me check it out. Thank you for please. It says, um, uh, well, there is a comment about integrated curriculum projects. Uh -huh. It says, we're greatly advised in this new, appro in this new approach to English language teaching. Um, another comment was about equipment, then how to engage students, how to get parents compromised because sometimes they don't take virtual lessons seriously. Uh, there's another, oh, there's a question about technology. It says, um, what do you think about technology like robots? Would, would they replace teachers? Mm -hmm. And that's a very good question. All right, and about, yes, about the mini projects, uh, the intention of the mini project is to uh, integrate, you know, to that we can see the curriculum beyond the classroom, that we can integrate the curriculum with the real world. 
and um, and and now in this situation that we are facing, where we have to you know to slow down the pace because of these uh, scenarios that were already described by you teachers, because when I was reading that, I felt that most of them were speaking for all of you. Um, I think that um, now we are, we are not like telling the teachers that they have to do the mini projects, right? Because it takes, it takes, it takes the six weeks, but still, if there are possibilities to do mini projects every week, like mini, mini tasks that students can do at home as part of their, of their, of the, of, but, but something very small. For example, I think that if we are in first grade or it could be even in third grade, greetings that is basic for an A1, you know, to use greetings appropriately. And if we tell the kids, okay, this is your task. You are going to go home and you're going to greet three people, right? Perhaps one day you are going to use greetings for the morning so that they can say good morning or they can say, um, how are you? Or they can say, um, how are you doing? Or So that they can use three different greetings, greet three people, you know, make sure you do it. Uh, next, next, next day, use three ways to say goodbye or one way to say goodbye to three people. Say goodbye in English. See you later. Bye bye. Um, so that uh, th that mini project doesn't demand, you know, doesn't demand. But but at the end, they will be, you know, using several forms of greetings. They will be using introduce yourself to three people in English, you know, or teach three people how to introduce yourself in English or two people. So I think it's something that we can do that is achievable for the learner. You are not giving something that is huge and 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 at the end is going to be useful in the development of one competence to greet. I can greet in English. You're not I can't I can say hello. I can um, ask for the name or I can say my name in English. Uh, so that's my answer in terms of the of the mini project. In terms of how to make uh, online learning effective, I think online learning is effective if we plan it carefully. As we planned very carefully for face to face, um, you know, uh, for a, for a face to face classroom, I think online demands even more. Mm -hmm. Because because you need to make sure that everything is you know very well organized and you are going to be showing the videos you are going to be showing this and and that everything is very well organized i think planning in a virtual class is even much more important uh, in the case of teachers that create blocks or things like those i think it's easier because they can you know store and organize in the block everything you know like a type of platform uh, but we need to make sure that resources are handy that are there that the kid can go that you can monitor even if it's possible to monitor what they are doing and we know that now microsoft teams and and zoom allow a lot for creating breakout rooms where they can interact uh, so i think that if we are able to organize and plan very well our online class it could work greatly right, to maintain the student's attention. Experts say that online classes for young learners cannot go beyond 20 minutes because they will lose attention or 30 minutes and they, they can continue working in the house, uh, but they should not be like long, long classes. In the case of, of, of children, that's a, a recommendation that I have read in articles and um, specialized books. Now, about if robots are going to substitute teachers, I think that especially in the case of, of children, I think that the face-to-face -face interaction is very important at young uh, ages because kids are learning the basics of socialization. They need to socialize. They need to learn the rules, how to interact, how to communicate, how to be empathetic to other people's feelings. You know, and I think that um, at young ages, this interaction, face-to-face -face interaction is, is very important to create bonds as well between, uh, among, with other people. It's not the same that the bond is constructed virtually, especially in the case of, of, of children. Um, and, and I think that uh, what we as teachers need to, need to like be aware is that 
even online or face-to-face -face our work as thinkers and as um, uh, designers of intentional designers of the best way you know uh, to organize learning i think that if we do it if we do it in the right way that will always be needed um so uh, i i don't think that in the near future robots are going to substitute teachers but what i do think is that we teachers need to really get into uh incorporating fully technology in learning and making sure that what we are doing is as effective you know as it is if we do it very well face to face because we can have face to face in face to face we can have very poor teaching we can have very poor teaching face to face and we can have very poor teaching in a virtual environment so i think a lot depends on how we organize how we plan teaching so that students really benefit from that um let me see there are two more questions yes. says a big challenge is to lessen the gap between private and public schools talking about distance learning well that, that she tried to that was sort of a question right that's a big that's a, a big challenge can you repeat like, that, Romy, again? It please? says it says a big challenge is to lessen the gap between private and public schools. Like, how how would you picture that taking into account distance learning? I think I will go back again to um, I think two things that are key. One is to make sure that we equip equip all schools with the what they need you know so that kids have the resources that they need and they can take it home a tablet or a phone so that they can receive you know the classes in this pandemic what i was able to see is that private schools you know the the, the families of those kids most of them had and have you know, good connectivity and also have a computer or a tablet available for the student. So that means that the students continued having their lessons every day on a regular basis. In, in the case of the public system, as you said, very sadly, the conditions are very uneven. There is not no equity. So the people that do not have the connectivity, that do not have the equipment, the families that do not have it, and therefore the students, those are begin to be left behind. And some of them begin to get, you know, even disconnected. Some are dropping out the schools. So I think that um, something that is urgent, that, you know, is for yesterday, not for today, is to create or provide students with what they need so that this can happen so that we are you know bridging that gap and um and i think teachers as well i think we teachers need to become long life learners we teachers need to become a hundred percent committed with expanding with growing with understanding that you know, we cannot, as I said, it's like a wall. Those myths that I mentioned at the beginning are like, um, like these straight jackets that we have that we need to, you know, cut, take out, and and you know, try to embrace the change, embrace the change, and 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 I think that's the only way. So I think the teacher and the, the resources available for learners. Is, is very important. And of course, as I said during my talk, we need the commitment of families. Now families are playing a new role, you know, that uh, at least in our society, in our society, parents used to be, you know, absent, ignored, but now we know that we need them so that this can, you know, keep on moving. And, and, and they know also that they need to 
put something in if they want their children to advance in their education. So uh, that, that's my, 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 you know, my idea. We need to find ways for um, developing more the skills of teachers. We need to work with teachers much more so that they feel also confident, they feel cared of, they feel that they are highly valued in order to, to um, respond to the needs because our children are being left behind. Our children are being left behind and the most precious uh, resource Costa Rica and any nation has is, you know, the, are those children. So I think we need to, to really make those changes fast. Thank you, Anna. We have two more questions. Uh, we're going to share with you through email uh, because of time. Sure, sure. It will be my pleasure. It will be my pleasure. Um, and, and I hope we keep this conversation talking, uh, going, sorry. Uh, I really like the, the theme of this uh, seminar, which is, you know, create, not, not creating, but making stronger this community of practice. And in order to, to make a community, we need to, to be in touch. Let's use the, 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 the technology that we have available and let's try to keep on working and, and, and thinking and proposing and moving the change forward. Thank you so much, Dr. Campos. Thank you for your participation. All your ideas, they were wonderful. Thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Thank you.